Um, the first question that I have for you is I would like all grocery store owners, managers, workers, or volunteers that are here in the room today to stand up. If you work, volunteer, or own or manage a rural store, I want you to stand. Now, I am not saying that the other people in the room are insignificant, but I applaud you today because I am one of you. I am a store manager myself, and you chose to be here today, which means that you care about how the rural stores in our community are functioning and want to see change that is going to allow your store to not just survive, but to thrive. So congratulations for being here today. Our 
small areas and small communities out there for the possibility of us maybe figuring out how to make our supply a little more consistent for our rural stores. Identify network opportunities to build capacity. Now, with a rural store, a lot of times we're out in the middle of nowhere. There might be another store 15 miles away or 30 miles away. And how many of us are at the not end of the spectrum and we look at this competition? Instead of someone that we could actually work together with to better service our communities. And that is where some of our mindset needs to change. We need to look at how we can work together for the sake of our communities. We're not competition, we're looking to build and make our stores and the communities all over North Dakota more stable with their food sources. We actually have 118 independent grocery stores that were asked to participate. Now, like Laurie said, you know there's more than that out there. And we've heard of more as we got ready for this grocery meeting here. 53 actually completed the survey, which is wonderful. Now, you don't have to raise your hands, you might feel really guilty. But I wonder if there's many of you in the store here who actually didn't complete that survey when it was given to you. And part of that is, is because if you're like me and you're the manager of the store, you're not only working constantly trying to keep the employees going, you're doing the orders, you're doing mopping the floors, you're organizing the shelves. So completing the survey wasn't a priority. However, as we move forward and try to grow and stabilize, please be open to that next survey that comes through your mailbox and take time to fill it out. So we can better analyze the needs of our rural stores and help you get what you need to be able to stabilize and succeed. Okay? Now, you guys get to participate. You don't just have to sit up here and listen to me talk the whole time. Get out your little handy dandy little voters, please. And we want to know where your store is located. Now, if you're not a store owner and manager, we would still encourage you to vote. Where are you located in the state? Where are you shopping? Okay, okay let's see what our total is. 15% from the northwest, 15% northeast, 40 southwest, and 30 southeast is here represented within our room today. Okay? Now, and moving on, weekly sales. This is, I was talking with another um, rural store uh, owner who actually, she helps in the management functioning of our store, and she's like, oh, this is so embarrassing, you know, we're just over 200,000 in sales. You know what? That's what most of our rural stores are. They range anywhere from 200000 to maybe $275,000 a year. If you're really lucky, you'll be between that two hundred eighty dollars and $320,000 a year mark. Um, and that's because a lot of the communities that we are seeing that have these rural stores is real similar to my community, 285 people. Our store sales in the seven years that we've been under our current structure have ranged anywhere from $185,000 in a year all the way up to $285,000 in a year, depending on how the year's going, or the management that we have, or the community gathering around and supporting the store. So it says here, though, that 62% have greater than $20,000 a week. That just blows my mind. But there are some of those ones that we would consider big ones. We'd consider those to be big stores. 12% of us have a weekly sales of less than $5,000, and honestly, the less than $5,000, the, the $3,000, $4,000 to $7,000 markers, kind of where I would put it, are our stores that are struggling the most trying to decide whether or not they're going to stay open from day to day. Because we have a hard time with supply. We have a hard time bringing in our consumers. We have a hard time hiring labor, which we're going to get into all that stuff as well as we build around. Here we go. Where's your sales? Do you have any clue? Now, some of you aren't involved in the store in your area, so I understand that. You may not really know. Where are your stores at? Okay. Good. 19% less than 527 between 5,000 and 10,000. 19, 10,000 to 20. And 35, 20,000 and greater than 20,000. Now, every store, no matter what their sales level, tends to have a lot of the same issues because depending on how big or how small your store is, depends on your marketing depends on your labor, how many staff you can afford, how many volunteers you have. It varies from community to community and store to store. Future sales, 
Brothers. I don't know if you can see the little key up in the top corner there, but they're color-coded. Super Value is like the bluish purple, Spartan Nash is the red, and the Mesa Bludgers is green. Brothers is green there. Okay, so you can kind of see where they are going in the state. And this is only according to our survey. You may be on there and, you know, there's a little circle, but um, this was according to our survey. Hey, <coughs> do you feel that you have a good choice of vendors where you are located? Okay, yes, I can choose which vendors I want. No, I'm limited to because of my location or sales volume. I would venture to challenge you that if you are one of those stores that are traveling to a big city to stock up, you're probably more of a no than a yes. Because you can't get what you need from the suppliers that are coming your direction. You have to put that volunteer time in or that extra work in to supply your consumers. <coughs> okay? And yes, technically we get to choose our vendors, but we are limited. You know, whether they're going to come to our store or not, or whether we can order enough that they're willing to come to our store, right? Okay, everybody got their votes in? Let's see what our percentages are. Wow! <coughs> Look at that. This is one of the top reasons why our stores in rural North Dakota are struggling. It's because we have a hard time with our supply trying to get the products into our store. And it's not that necessarily they can't get into our store, but it's sometimes at a price that we can afford to buy and then mark it up that our consumers will be willing to pay for it. You're going to hear some more awesome news about supply and that in Neil's presentation later today, so I'm not going to talk too much more about it. Minimum buying requirements. 25% indicated that meeting minimum cases requirements is a problem. Now, one of the vendors that I order from is kind of a weird vendor for a rural grocery store. I actually order from Cisco Foods. And it started because Cisco was trying to get involved in our community. We had a restaurant at the time. We have a school in our community. And then they were trying to see what I might be able to buy from them. Well, I found that <coughs> Cisco Foods actually has some great fresh meat that I've been able to use in my store, packaged in ways that I can sell it easily. Um, and it was cheaper than what I could get from my convenience store provider. However, they had a 15 case minimum. So I started marketing at my community fresh meat every week. Well, holy smokes. I had 15 cases. I know that doesn't sound like a lot to some of you suppliers, but 15 cases is a lot for a small store. And so I have to make choices every single week. Can I afford to get 15 cases? What can I afford to get from them? What other products do they have that I can possibly put in my store? So, those minimum case requirements make a difference. That is one reason why a lot of us smaller stores are not ordering from the bigger grocery suppliers as well, because of that $10,000 or $12,000 requirement for that. Okay? We also have issues in the smaller stores um, that a lot of times we're required to buy by case or half case, and even that amount of food may not move quickly enough. Now, there's a couple reasons that that happens. When I first started working at our store, our store was really struggling, and as I told you, we were looking at closing. Closing our doors every month was whether or not we were going to keep our doors open. I came in in August, and I'm going to be really honest, a year ago August, I was one of those community members that didn't shop much at my store, unless I needed one can of this, or a gallon of milk, or a loaf of bread, because I was feeding a family of eight, and I could not afford the prices. Cereal at my little store was seven and eight dollars a box for cereal. Okay, milk was six to seven dollars a gallon. Um, now bread was actually reasonable because they had a bread man coming through every week, so bread wasn't too bad. But even canned goods would typically be between fifty cents and a dollar fifty more for a can of it than what I could get if I drove forty-five miles and filled my vehicle once a month. So I was guilty of being one of those consumers that did not support my local store. So when I came into our local store, I observed for a couple months, and I started updating our inventory and seeing what we had on the floor and what our markup was. Well, our store had been struggling so much that they were marking things up anywhere from 40 to 80 percent above cost to pay the bills. Okay? But if you mark up that high, 40 to 80 percent above cost, who's going to buy it? Nobody. We used to have a whole aisle, like those two end walls back there, that was all filled with clearance stuff because those cases weren't selling. They were expiring before they could sell. 
So I did something. I put my neck out to be chopped off, and the other manager didn't like what I had to say. And the board was very leery. But I said, we have two choices. One, we continue doing what we're doing, and this store closes. Or two, we lower our prices, we lower our markup, and we market to families in this community. So in January, the board approved of that. And systematically, I went through the store. One week, I would take our cereal, and I slashed all of our prices. Our cereal is now $3.59 to $3.99 a box. I only buy it when it's on sale. I only buy it when it's on sale, and I stock up enough to last me till the next sale. So it requires some forethought. But, <laughs> well, but, it, but it allows me, and when I run out, I do have places that I buy, yeah, a couple boxes to get through. Um, but it allows me then, families come in and they're like, oh my word, I can buy a box of cereal here now. And then they look and they say, wow, spaghetti sauce is at $4 a jar. It's now $1.99, $2.29, or oh my word, they have sales. Look at those little tags hanging there. So people are starting to come back to our store because we've lowered our prices on 80% of the product throughout our store. And our store sales have actually increased, which means we're selling more volume. And my clearance shelf has gone from a great big aisle that big, two or three rows full, to an end cap with only two shelves that sometimes has stuff on it. Now that was a big leap of faith that our board chose to take by lowering prices systematically through our store. But we supported that with marketing to our community and reaching out to our community and saying, this is your store. We are your store. Choose to support your local store. See what you can afford to buy here. We know we don't have everything, but see what you can afford to buy here and then go out from there. So all of these things affect that minimum buying requirement. Can't make the case months, we talked about that. Supply required minimum, we hit on that too. Local foods, 69% sell locally produced foods or goods. 15 different types are listed, different produce, meats, baked items, coffee, Pride of Dakota items. We have a lot of Pride of Dakota items in our store, um, which is really kind of fun because folks will come through and look for that. It's actually a draw to when people are visiting in the community to have all those Pride of Dakota items marked throughout the store. Um, things like Dots pretzels go flying off the shelf, you know, because they're a Pride of Dakota item and once people try them, they're addicted for life. And Pride of Dakota items don't expire. Very few of them have an expiration date. Mine won't last long enough to expire. But <laughs> <laughs> the ones that I carry, but that's good to know. <laughs> Very good to know. Um, we also carry uh, Bessie's Best Milk, because Bessie's Best is close to us. So we carry that as a local. I do have a, um, a gardener farmer in our community that works in farmer's markets. And I work with her to bring in tomatoes and corn and other fresh items that my community is able to pick up right at the store instead of driving out to her farm to grab it and get it locally. And then they usually do pick up a few other things while they're in there shopping as well. Okay? And that's something that even like, um, I appreciated how David shared that. It needs to be a collaboration. A lot of times we do look at, oh my word, if there's a farmer's market, I'm never going to have enough pounds to place my Ross Davis order this week. And I really, really get that. But I think part of the heart of a real grocery store is that we have to be very community-minded. And part of that community-mindedness is trying to find ways in our local community that we can bring things in, like a local farmer that's producing, and bring that into our community. Showing that aspect of community spirit in our community a lot of times will increase our sales at our store because they see us working together within our community. One thing that our store does to promote community, and it's not really locally produced, produced foods and goods, but we work with all of our nonprofits in our community. Any nonprofit organization, churches, lions, the public school, whatever, if they order from my store, they get 10% off. Boom. And I made that known through the community, sent letters out, they start shopping at our store more, they come back to buying things from our store instead of traveling to Bismarck to stock up for big events for their fundraisers and stuff, because we're offering them discounts working together within our communities. Common challenges. Top three cha common challenges are people shopping out of town. People don't mind traveling anymore for the most part, do they? They will easily drive 45 minutes to an hour, fill their vehicle once a month, 
and come back and live off of it, and then just kind of trickle into your store for the one thing they need for that recipe, right? People aren't afraid to shop, to travel. So that's where we, as our rural stores, have to figure out a way to market to our consumers and meet their needs on a more personal level so that they will choose to buy what they can from us first, and then go get the other things elsewhere at another time. And that is often a real juggling match. You have to understand what your consumers need. I found that very interesting that David said that that's one of the big things they address at their meeting is customer service. Understanding your consumers, knowing how to meet your consumers' needs, and being able to meet those needs while at the same time still keeping things in the black. That is a big challenge for our rural stores because we're so concerned about keeping our doors open. We often don't take the time to get to know our community's needs and what we can do to better service them. We do have the competition from large chain stores. For be safe, when it comes off the truck and it already costs more than what Walmart sells it for, I'm toast. Right? <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about, especially in the smaller stores. So we have to play that juggling act of trying to figure out what we can buy on sale, what we can keep enough in the store on sale so I can permanently lower that price. So that people will buy it from me all the time instead of just when they happen to need it. And we play, we try to figure out where's the cheapest, the best, that, you know, where I can rely on that source, get it in my store. The availability of satisfactory labor. That one is very interesting, especially for the smaller stores. We actually have five employees at our store. I am the manager. I am considered, quote unquote, full time. However, I only get paid for about 25 hours a week and I volunteer the rest of my time because I want to see my store succeed. And many of the smaller stores that are less than $10,000 a week in sales have volunteers that come in and help that store run, or they would have to shut their doors. Our store has approximately 40 hours worth of volunteer time every single week. And our store is open for 55 hours a week. So the volunteers do help. We only have <coughs> one paid employee on at all times. So when I'm there managing, I'm placing the orders, working with my vendors, updating inventory, mopping the floor, running the till, stocking the shelves, you name it. And I'm the only one there doing it. That is a real challenge for our rural stores. And one challenge worked in there too is if it's not a community-owned store, but an individually-owned store, the people in those communities don't necessarily see the need to help because it's like, well, it's their problem, not my job. So, we have to figure out ways to connect to our community and for our communities to realize that we're having these stores to service our community to keep that food desert from occurring in our local area. Collaborating, 40% actually do collaborate in some way with other small stores in the sharing of ideas, cooperative advertising and marketing, and helping to achieve those minimum buying requirements. I was actually really surprised to see that number, that 40% are collaborating. And I think that's one area where we need to kind of look into it a little bit more. 52% feel that statewide alliances of small independently owned grocery stores may have some kind of value. A lot of the smaller stores um, in the lower end of that sphere, we feel like we're all alone and flailing out there trying to figure out how are we going to make it through the next month or the next year. So trying to develop a collaboration where we can talk, where we can network, where we can have connections to each other will probably be helpful as we move on. Would you be interested in helping to form or participate a statewide alliance of rural grocery stores for networking and other purposes? Yes or no? <coughs> you will have opportunity on this survey that you're going to fill out our exit survey. If you are marking yes to this question, please make sure you leave your contact information. Now that doesn't necessarily mean, oh my word, I have to go to a monthly meeting. I don't have time for a monthly meeting. Hey, we are going to try to come up with some ways that we can network, that we can talk, that we can collaborate, that we can make things happen. So don't be afraid to get involved. If you have, page, if you have a passion for our rural communities and the rural stores, please be willing to put yourself out there and get involved. Oops, where'd I go? Oh, and the percentages. Oh, good. 83% yes, said yes. Awesome. We will look forward to seeing how that is going to come to fruition. Well, 84% answered yes for the local support, their store. There were a lot of mixed responses. 
81% of our rural stores believe that revenue shopping out of town is their major challenge. And I've kind of addressed that already in my um, talking through other slides. We have people that are willing to travel and shop. We do have people that support us. However, you know, there are some people in your community that think they're supporting you when they come in and buy one can of beans. Honey, one can of beans ain't going to pay the bills. Okay? So that's where we have to figure out how to reach our consumers and make them truly understand the picture, understand what it means to support local, understand that, oh my God, we have great sales. And you know what, but my stuff is on sales. It's the same price as Walmart. Choose to take it here instead. We have to figure out ways to reach out to our consumers and draw them in and have them desire to support the local stores. <clears throat> Customer rank um, priorities here. Customers feel that customer service is important. Hours of operation, the quality and availability of food, the prices of items. Isn't it interesting that prices of items is number five? And that is something actually that in our tiny little Hazleton community, we did a, a survey last year, and people said they were willing to pay a little more at our store, but it was a little more, not a $16 can of coffee that they can buy for $8 in somewhere else. Okay, it's a little bit more, and that's where we have to be able to mind and make some changes. Managers, quality of food is a big thing we worry about. Customer service, our prices of items, availability, hours of operation, and buying locally. That's what we found there. Marketing, opportunities and challenges. Marketing <coughs> has to be in our local areas. However, sometimes the smaller stores have a hard time having a marketing budget. My marketing budget is this. So every time I want to market in my community, I go to the bank and say, hey, I want to send flyers home with the public school kids. Would you be willing to make copies for me? And they do. They're like, oh, sure. So then I send a flyer home with the school kids saying, family special this month. For every $30 you spend, you get a free loaf of bread. And I send it home with my elementary kids in the community. I try to market, but I have to market cheaply and have to market in a smart way to draw those consumers in. Advertising and sales flyers, I designed my own instead of using what's pre-printed because I was able to, once again, we got ours donated from a local printer in our community, which is just a blessing, but that doesn't happen all the time. But sometimes thinking through how you're connecting with your consumers is really important. Keep things affordable, keeping customers in town, and the cost of advertising. Store operations, employees, average employees per store is 13. Most of us have a lot less than that that are actually paid employees. If you have any paid employees at all, if you're in that 5,000 or less round. 80% <coughs> do not have volunteers. Those would be our larger stores throughout the world's um, settings. They don't have anyone willing to volunteer. It has to all be paid employees, and they're still trying to figure out how to get stuff done with the little bit of paid employees that they have. This is a large market chain. Average distance is 49 miles, but as we see that a lot of people, they don't care about traveling 49 miles anymore. They'll do it, so we got to figure out how to reach those consumers. There's little quick shops or smaller convenience stores. 22% have another full-service grocery store in their community. Saturday. This survey represents a snapshot of challenges, strengths, and opportunities that we've hit on so far. The core themes are people shopping out of town, competition, availability of labor, supply, I believe is a big core thing for our area too, which you're going to have an opportunity to get involved in in the breakout sessions. Now there was a deep emphasis on price of food, which I think that really varies from store to store and what your supplier is. Okay, because for me, price of the food is, is way, way out the top. Way out the top. Emphasis of quality food and customer service. Local food sales, volumes, all the sort of stuff we've been talking about. Local food could be a point of differentiation for independent grocery store chain stores. Consumer perspective in an area requiring is an area requiring further research. We and that's where I said, and a lot of this has to happen in your own communities. You got to figure out what your consumers need, what they want, how you can better meet their needs, how you can reach out to them and keep them shopping in your store. Next step. Another survey, a survey of consumers possibly, researching their shopping habits. Brochures could be convened to share our best practices and generate potential collaborative opportunities in the creation of statewide independent grocers alliance. Now we are blessed in North Dakota. We do have the North Dakota Grocers Association. 
I think what I have heard, and I kind of speak from experience here, but I've heard that a lot of our smaller stores aren't necessarily involved in the North Dakota Grocers Association at this point. But that's somewhere where I think we need to look to be involved so that we can get that input. Yes? Can I jump in here real quick and just open the door for me here? Um, I, I want to introduce myself. I'm Roger Larson. I've uh, been a retail grocer in North Dakota for my whole life, like 40 years. But anyway, my biggest thing I'm looking forward to in about two weeks, I'm going to be taking over as president of the North Dakota Grocery Association. So this really is my passion, and I'm really excited to see all of this. And so I just want to let you know I'm sucking all this in. And, and I've been in small town grocery stores my whole life, and uh, so I'm really excited to be in that arena where I can be an advocate for the small groceries as well as the larger grocery. When you think about it, we all have the same problems, whether it's a larger store or a smaller store, and I've, I've been on both sides of it. So I just want to introduce myself. So you have membership applications with you? Oh, I know, but I will be. <laughs> They're at night. <laughs> You can I, 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 I will take over to the first of February, but what I do want to say is the first year on the job, I will be out in the field. I mean, that's one of the things that hasn't been happening, and so I will be out the road introducing myself, going to the zones, and talking about those things. There's a lot of things we can do together. So. Very good. Well, we're looking forward to that. I think Roger's going to do an excellent job working with our rural stores and helping to unify us both the large stores and the small stores and help identify what their needs are and move towards some greater improvement and stability throughout North Dakota. Create or enhance existing, we already have an existing association which we just talked about with, with Roger, but do we, what do we need to be able to communicate, to be able to network, to be able to get the ideas, what's working, what's not working. Now today we're going to do that in our breakout sessions, but it needs to continue. More networking opportunities, um, develop a unified marketing campaign. Like I said, take advantage of what the NDARC put out there on their Facebook page. That little blip about food deserts. Use that to market in your community. Um, we're going to go ahead and skip over this for right now. Develop a retailers cooperative. What we're looking more towards, we don't want you to think we want, we don't want a cooperative necessarily, but what we need is a collaboration. We need stores that are able to work together in units in their areas so that they can have better sources for supplies, much like David shared with us earlier today. So a co-op probably isn't the best term. It's one that we hear and we think, oh my word, they want us to do a co-op. But we want you to be willing to work together and think outside of the box instead of thinking of yourself as a solo entity. We want you to be willing to build and grow with others for the sake of all of rural North Dakota. 